And so um, just as a, as a note for yourselves, um, and we will have this available online later if there are colleagues who were not able to join and would like to, would like to join. Um, what we'll do is during the presentations, you can post your question and answers in the chat. Uh, we're gonna let Jonathan Moreno run through all the content and then we'll circle back. We should have time at the end for a pretty robust discussion. Um, if you can keep your mute, uh, mics muted and cameras turned off in case people have lower bandwidth, um, that would be great. Um, any difficulties, just send a message to uh, the host and we'll get it sorted. Okay. So for those who aren't familiar with IPA, if this is your first time joining one of our webinars, really what, what we are all about um, is turning, uh, is developing better evidence to make better policies for development issues that we, um, we believe are important for the world. And so in the context of consumer protection, a lot of this is about identifying new ways to measure consumer protection, issues or risks that we all experience uh, with these new digital technologies, to share that with our partners, and then to develop new approaches to things like preventing fraud, which is the discussion today, or addressing risks of over-indebtedness with, uh, with digital credit. Um, so we, um, through this Consumer Protection Research Initiative, we're currently uh, working uh, to develop solutions with partners, and we're focusing on um, four markets in particular, Bangladesh, Kenya, Nigeria, and Uganda. And this project collaborates with policymakers, financial service providers, and civil society to develop and test solutions um, around issues such as fraud, consumer redress, uh, product and pricing transparency, over-indebtedness. And we approach this through, uh, through two primary research methods. The first, what we call market monitoring and data analysis is, um, is what we'll be speaking to today. This is where there are so many new sources of administrative data out there that give us better insights into what consumers are experiencing in their new digital financial lives. And so we want to work with partners to um, collect data that is already out there. Or in some cases, we have to seek the data ourselves with things like consumer surveys, um, we're leveraging new channels like social media, which we believe is a great resource for monitoring. And, and basically, once we've, um, we've leveraged this administrative data to understand uh, can, what are the most important consumer risks, what are the experiences consumers have and the challenges they face, then we want to build solutions, right? We, it's not just about identifying problems, it's about testing new solutions. And so we run competitive research funds for um, randomized control trial impact evaluations. And we completed our first one in April of 2021. And I'm pleased to announce that we will likely be launching a new request for proposals in early 2022. So if you, um, you can look at the studies we've funded so far on the link I've shared on this webpage. And if you wanna bounce any ideas off of us having questions about this initiative and the work we do, um, please just email us at financialinclusion at povertyaction.org and we'd be happy to discuss further. Okay, and so today's agenda is pretty straightforward. Um, we'll hear from Jonathan Moreno for about 40 minutes and then we should have about 10, 15 minutes for a question and answer at the end. Um, okay, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Jonathan and Moreno. Thank you, Rafe. Um, can you in a second to share? Okay, well, thank you everyone for your time today. Um, regarding the agenda within this presentation, I thought I'd start using maybe the first two minutes or so to give a very brief high level uh, overview of the project. Uh, the, roughly the first half of the presentation, we'll kind of discuss the, the problem and kind of how we systematize evidence surrounding it. And then the second half, I'll turn it over to Bernal, who will discuss kind of the proof of, con uh, the proof of concept uh, for a proposed solution we've had uh, developed and uh, some of the results from this. And then we'll round, uh, wrap up and then uh, pass on to the question and feedback session. So moving into kind of, uh, you know, the project in a nutshell, I think given this audience, I'm sure you're all pretty well, well, well aware that there's been increased concerns over, I guess what we'll call for now problematic uh, finance mobile apps in recent years. And I think uh, there's, I think, increasing efforts to combat it, but our 
read of the situation is that it's a bit limited still by a few issues. Uh, for one, there seems to be a lack of understanding of the exact scale of the problem. You know, what is how many apps are we talking about? What is the prevalence? Uh, as well as the scope of the the problem. You know, different is this monolithic? How you know what are the different modes of operations that they may be using, uh, and how this comes across in in the various app stores. Some of the solutions that have been put forth, you know, I think they can be effective, but they tend to be a bit more on the reactive side than kind of proactive. Uh, and we've seen a, a pretty large proliferation of these uh, scam apps um, that seem to be taking a sort of whack-a-mole approach. You know, they have similar packages that are released in multiple iterations. So even if one gets taken down or even a few, uh, they are able to kind of morph quickly and multiply. So I think meanwhile, you know, as Rafe was mentioning, there's uh, you know existing administrative data. We know it's high quality, high frequency that we think we can leverage uh, to first kind of systematize the evidence regarding these kind of apps, and then uh, with this, once we can target a narrow subset of the problematic ones, we kind of or or we can target an increase a more narrow subset, uh, try to classify these, uh, and with these kind of labeled data, then apply machine learning techniques, uh, which we think can then increase kind of the efficiency and speed of dealing with this kind of rapid proliferation. Uh, particularly, in, our hope is that we can particularly push uh, and improve the ex ante vetting side. Um, so we, we've kind of done this as a proof of concept on a historical data cut. Uh, and kind of in short, the main takeaways are, you know, there's still some room for improvement, obviously, but we think that the preliminary results are still pretty promising and, and that this is a solution that could uh, be effective. So with that having been said, well, you know, I'll get straight into the problem and I won't spend too much time on kind of the anecdotal evidence other than to say that I think in this audience, you're, you're probably also aware that, you know, there's been increased media coverage highlighting problematic finance apps, uh, probably particularly regarding the digital lending space. Um, a lot of uh, anecdotal coverage of, you know, or anecdotes on borrowers who have been uh, deceived by outright scams or fallen victim to kind of predatory lenders uh, who have either usury rates or maybe abusive uh, collection uh, practices. And, you know, as such, I think there's increased stakeholders who are understandably getting involved in trying to develop solutions. Uh, the supervisory and regulatory responses are pretty multifaceted and uh, probably build on existing consumer protection initiatives to improve complaints channels, uh, in some case, uh, require registration of digital lenders and platforms, um, uh, improve data privacy regulation, uh, even come up with ways of like self-regulation, uh, like developing codes of conduct uh, for fintech lenders, uh, creating maybe public awareness campaigns around um, kind of to, to warn users of, of problematic apps, uh, and in most extreme cases, even kind of taking direct action to approach the app stores like Google. I think our, the Reserve Bank of India towards the end of last year uh, went to Google and kind of requ requested that they take down a number of apps that had been uh, flagged as being uh, highly problematic. There's external stakeholders that we know are also uh, coming up with solutions. So uh, for example, we know that uh, CGAP uh, has been doing some stuff using monitoring and social media, like uh, using natural language processing uh, to look through Facebook and Twitter feeds and see if they can develop kind of ex uh, early warning signs or kind of better categorize the types of issues that are being seen in uh, among fintech apps as well as kind of broader fintech lenders. And we know that RBI is also has a working group that's ongoing that uh, is using both uh, regulators and uh, external stakeholders to kind of see what kind of frameworks and solutions can be can be put forward. As kind of mentioned, though, you know, our, our read of the situation is that there's still kind of a systematic a la or a lack of systematic understanding of the exact scale and scope of this problem. Um, as mentioned, then the solutions, many of them seem a bit more reactive, meaning uh, requiring kind of a critical mass of complaints to be reached on a given app or, or a problematic lender before targeted action seems to be taken. And this couples with the fact that, you know, there's this whack of a mole approach uh, of these scam app developers as already described. And in practice, what this means is, you know, over the past few months, we've actually been uh, kind of systematically and manually reviewing a few thousand of these kind of problematic apps, uh, or, or we're still seeing a large number of these problematic apps and 
uh, a large number of users who are still falling victim. So again, in short, you know, our proposed solution is then to leverage kind of this existing high frequency admin data on apps uh, to apply machine learning techniques, uh, which we hope uh, we, we think can improve both, uh, particularly the ex ante vetting side, also the ex post monitoring as well. So let's get into, you know, the data that we're using is uh, app metadata, review data, and historical download data. I'm getting it from a third party app intelligence provider. Our uh, data coverage is actually the universe of finance category apps in the Google Play Store for 63 countries. And the time coverage, uh, it's a bit more nuanced where our, our app metadata is basically coming in historical data dumps, like monthly data dumps from January 2020 to April 2021. Um, some caveats on this, it's a bit left, it's, there's left censoring uh, involved where uh, apps that uh, are published anytime or are published on the stores anytime between January 2020 and onward, uh, you know, we're going to see uh, any apps that were unpublished that is removed from the app store prior to January 2020, uh, we're not going to see apps that may have been published before that date and then remain uh, Present throughout our time frame, our, our later time frame up until April 2021, we'll also see. Right now, for the review and download data, it's historical. Uh, so, in practice, what this means is that for any apps, unique apps that we identify uh, in the metadata that are published on the App Store from January 20 to April 2021, we can then match up and query its full history of review data and download data. And this could be from before January 2020. So this is from the initial release uh, release date of the app. Okay. So to make it, uh, I guess, I mean, maybe this is kind of clear, but just to make sure it's concrete uh, what these data contain. So app metadata in practice, it's you know any kind of text and images that uh, show up on, on kind of a given app page, uh, a given app on, on the app store. Uh, so, for example, this could include visible uh, data like the the text descriptions, uh, developer website, email address, physical address, and so forth. Uh, in practice, it also has a lot of underlying hidden data, um, internal version codes, uh, kind of lists or vectors of uh, software development kits or SDKs, permission lists, uh, the countries and languages the app is available in, and, and so on and so forth. I think the review data, you know, this is a bit more, I think, straightforward, but this includes um, for a given app, the disaggregated data uh, reviews, including the rating, data review, uh, review text. Um, a caveat here is that uh, our uh, third party provider, they don't provide the uh, username or profile pic, which we think captures some useful information. So we've actually been manually scraping this for a random subset. Um, as we think we could probably use it for some further analysis. And then sorry that I didn't, uh, I forgot to add a slide on histor the historical download data, but that, I think it's pretty uh, self-explanatory where for a given app package, we can query uh, its download estimates at the daily and country, country level. Okay. Okay, so with these data then, we turn to kind of systematizing kind of the evidence on uh, the scale and scope of the finance app market. So, you know, given that uh, most of the media coverage is uh, kind of focused on problematic digital lending apps, uh, to make the pilot tractable, we try to narrow down to kind of pure play personal loan apps of interest. So in other words, you know, we're starting with this full sample of uh, around 135,000 finance category apps. This, you know, this is quite broad and, uh, you know, in the, the Google Play Store, you know, they don't provide any further subcategorization. So in practice, you know, we we work to kind of categorize apps to kind of narrow narrow it down to a more targeted subset. Um, nothing too fancy here. Right now, we're just using regular expressions on the metadata, titles, short and long descriptions, uh, to tag uh, by product and provider type. Uh, so, for example, to tag, you know, personal loans, we're simply parsing the various texts for relevant keyword combinations, um, personal loan, consumer loans, MSME loans, and these kind of, these, these and so forth. Um, now, we also then kind of apply combinations of text to filter to more precise subcategories. So, uh, for example, in practice, you know, many commercial banks will have um, general banking platforms that, uh, general banking apps that uh, may have a wide range of, of products, uh, including personal loan within them. Now, 
these are understandably kind of a different category or, or a different uh, group altogether that we think are probably less relevant. Uh, so we, uh, for example, would then filter uh, this kind of category out through kind of combinations of, of different uh, tags. Now, in practice, I think this brings up one kind of current limitation of the, the approach where since we were using these kind of regular expressions to narrow down to the targeted subset, uh, you know, about 65% of the apps in the App Store and uh, the in the Google Play Store uh, have English listed as main language. So, you know, their meta app uh, descriptions are in English, and this approach would thus work. Uh, in practice, that means that about one third of the uh, finance apps uh, were sort of overlooking, uh, kind of by construction. And understandably, we we should move. We can move towards trying to integrate these as well. But for now, this is just to keep it. The, the pilot tractable. Okay, so uh, this yield, what does this yield? So uh, as mentioned, we're starting with around 135,000 uh, finance apps of interest. Uh, we're then kind of a first level filtering is, you know, we're focusing then on those that are English as main language. Uh, and then from there, kind of the tagging yields about, you know, 20%. Uh, are in panel B, about 20% respectively, are general banking and payment apps. The ones of interest for us are these kind of pure play personal loan apps, uh, which in practice comes out to about around 6% of, of the total English main language apps, or in other words, around 5,000, roughly around 5,000 apps of interest. Uh, something that stands out a little bit is that, you know, even though I guess in percentage terms of apps, it's uh, you know it's not perhaps the largest category, but in terms of the average downloads per apps, you know it's, it is it seems to be there is the highest demand for these around 160 thousand on average per app in this category, vis-a-vis uh, -vis kind of a general uh, average of around 46,000, 47,000. Beyond that, you know, when we start looking at some of the characteristics of these, so, so now we kind of focus on these personal loan apps and look at some other characteristics. And you know, there's suggestive evidence that there's unusual uh, issues or, or evidence of problems. So in particular, we observe uh, extremely high churn rates uh, among these personal loan apps relative to other finance app categories. So what we mean by this is, you know, the the data allow us to kind of track which are the apps that are being newly released uh, during our study period from January 2020 to April 2021, as well as those that are removed uh, unpublished uh, off the app stores. Now, you know, to be removed, it doesn't have to be necessarily a sign that it's uh, predatory or fraud. Uh, you know, there may be legitimate reasons for doing so, but in, in practice, you know, most of the time when the uh, developers or, or lenders are changing uh their their apps are kind of they're updating the same app package id uh through a increase in or a change in the version rather than taking it down and releasing a new one altogether so i think when you see really high uh churn rates it's it's definitely suggestive of some kind of underlying problems and in practice you know what we do see is that about 70 percent of the uh personal loan apps that we've tagged that are 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 really newly released in this uh, roughly one and a half year time period, and about fifty percent, fifty two percent are drop that are dropped out or removed. Uh, and this, if we benchmark this against the kind of general uh, average in kind of column one, you know, we see that this is several times times higher. Another sign is you know that their average time on the App Store is noticeably smaller. You know, less than uh, less than a year, um, again, relative to closer to two and a half to three years uh, for the average app uh, in this uh, it, uh, it average finance app uh, in the Google Play Store. So this is kind of building on the previous uh, table, but uh, we add two kind of elements of, of information here. We first start breaking it out by uh, the availability across different country markets. Um, and then secondly, as mentioned, we actually go through and manually tag uh, these uh, apps over the past, or we have been over the past few months. Uh, and through this, we're able to kind of get an updated um, count on the number of apps that have been unpublished now as of like roughly September 2021. And what we see is that regarding the first point, you know, the 
churn seems fairly consistent across these different country markets. So this is kind of a sign that, you know, the apps seem to operate in multiple markets or are, are available in multiple markets. There's certainly some that are restricted to, to an individual market, um, but it does seem like it's a little bit fluid in that sense. And then the second, uh, regarding the second point, you know, we see that the, uh, there's a, probably another 10% of apps that are removed between April 2021 and September 20, uh, September 2021. So uh, again, I think this is kind of, again, suggestive that, you know, our targeting is getting to uh, a group of apps that are of particular interest and that there are suggestions that they seem to be um, problematic for various reasons. Okay. So we can talk a little bit about the supply or the proliferation of supply. So this is a, a time series chart uh, where the y-axis is the number of new newly released apps by, by date. Um, the x-axis time scale is at the year week level. Uh, as mentioned previously, there's sort of this left censoring issue where any apps that are unpublished prior to week, uh, 2020 week one, uh, we're not going to really see. So in that, in that sense, uh, these, the, the kind of apps that we are seeing coming in, uh, in this uh, first period prior to 2020 week one are those that were released prior to our main study sample and in practices about maybe 20, 25% of, of the personal lending apps. Um, but then from 2021, 2020 week one onwards, what we're seeing is about probably between 50 to 60 new personal lending apps coming out on the market every week. So in other words, several hundred personal lending apps per month, uh, several thousand per year, uh, which I think it's a little bit at the, the scale of the kind of proliferation and why uh, it'd be very difficult to kind of keep track and, and manually monitor this. Moving now to kind of disaggregated uh, uh, or country disaggregated figures. So here, uh, this is reflecting apps that are app availability by country market. And then we further add in a, a second uh, time series line, the, the ones uh, marked in blue, where it's the number of apps that are newly released in, in the given time period that are only available in that given market. So here, I think that the main takeaways are that uh, all, uh, you know, the uh, among the few country markets that we, we kind of investigate in detail, India, Nigeria, and Philippines, you know, all have decent, a fair amount of exposure to these kind of uh, personal lending apps. Uh, there do seem to be signs that India in particular um, is probably most targeted or most exposed in, in terms of uh, like any app being available as well as uh, apps that are targeted to only the Indian uh, kind of lending space. Okay, so let me kind of move forward now. So like at this point, you know, we've targeted this uh, subset of about 5,000 5, pure play lending apps of interest. Um, and from here, we spent, the, you know, a few weeks going over them manually and tagging them based on kind of typology as well as uh, classification of kind of legitimate versus suspect. Um, and kind of regarding the, the first part of this, you know, the typology, we, we sort of wanted to get a sense of kind of the modes of operation uh, that we were seeing among this, this subset of apps. In, in practice, what we, uh, what we kind of identified is that uh, there was uh, the largest group, maybe around seven, 75% are what we would call kind of direct personal lending apps where they're either directly providing personal loans or claiming to. Uh, and you know, we're pretty agnostic as to the provider type in this, in this sense. We, we, we include them all as long as they're pure play apps that seem to be claiming to provide, uh, uh, directly provide a personal loan. The second, uh, we say around 20%, or we see around 20% fall under a category of uh, what we'd say kind of indirect personal lending apps where they don't seem to be directly offering any loan, but rather serving as sort of a marketplace or a guide uh, to access personal loans. And you know, in practice, we see that some are more or less transparent about you know, playing this kind of uh, intermediary role. And then finally, we see a smaller minority, maybe around 5% that, uh, are kind of peripheral to personal lending, um, like loan calculators or apps uh, supposedly providing credit scores. 
um, that they're high enough in frequency that we decide to include them uh, in in the sample, uh, but you know we we have considered uh, inclusion and exclusion as kind of sensitivity tests in, in later models. So so that's uh, kind of the typology in terms of kind of the the types of services that are potentially being provided. In terms of classification, then um, you know based on our initial reviews, you know we broadly kind of classify them into a few forms of suspect apps. The first are what we'd consider kind of being an example of pure fraud, uh, where in our case, we uh, characterize this by the existence of, of fake reviews. So consider this first example. This is a, a personal lending app, uh, supposedly available only in India. You know, at first glance, you know, it has seemingly fairly good ratings uh, among a decent sized uh, cohort. Uh, as you start going through kind of disaggregated reviews of some strange signals seem to pop up. Um, among them, you know, there's examples or, or uh, you know, we, we kind of identify different signals that seem to be indicative that there's kind of systematic farm, uh, fake reviews or kind of review farming that seems to be present. So there's kind of idiosyncratic uh, or irregular review dates, uh, abnormal usernames that really don't fit the market or, or seem fake altogether, um, idiosyncratic text that shows up uh, as uh, as a few examples. Uh, and then when you move to kind of the the reviews that are coming in from that are from lower lower ratings and presumably from real users, um, you know, you start seeing kind of more regular distribution of kind of review dates, uh, high propensity for people to be complaining about being duped by existence of fake reviews. Uh, a com like uh, something we see frequent enough that it seems to be maybe kind of the the modus operandi is uh, people complaining about paying some kind of registration fee. Um, it can be nominal in many cases, not huge in some sense, like maybe ten uh, U.S. dollars equivalent, uh, but receiving no kind of service. And you know this isn't uh, limited to just the Indian market. Um, so consider this example now from uh, the Nigerian uh, market where we see essentially the same reviewer um, basically giving the same review or a very similar review uh, on kind of eight different personal loan packages uh, within probably like a 10 day uh, window. So, I mean, for, for from our view, you know, this is probably, I mean, this is a bit anecdotal, but it's a bit of a suggestion that, you know, this is evidence of kind of that there are, is kind of systematic review farming going on um, or, uh, even in a best case scenario where this is a real user, then it's kind of raising different issues about, I guess, multiple borrowing and uh, over indebtedness. A second uh, category that we classify as what we consider predatory uh, with no real services being provided. So here's another example, or consider this example now from the Nigerian setting where, um, you know, the, the rating, mean rating can still seem, I guess, passable, okay. Uh, when you start looking into kind of again the disaggregated reviews and look at the five star ratings or the better the, the better star ratings, uh, you know they do seem to be coming in from real users. So it's separate from this fake user uh, uh, phenomenon that we we flagged as being pure fraud. However, like when you start reading these the, the reviews in detail, you know there's signs that there's really no services that have been provided. You know they've they're giving glowing reviews, but they consistently are mentioning that they're, they, they're waiting for approval or they're waiting for a loan. Um, so in a sense, and, and others kind of start to kind of reveal that in many cases, it seems like they're being coerced to give good ratings uh, to increase their likelihood of, of receiving a loan. Then when you get to kind of the lower star ratings, um, similarly, this backs up that there's no services ever really ever being provided. Um, there's kind of signs that sometimes they're uh, concerned that they've released, revealed a lot of uh, personally identifiable information that potentially could have uh, uh, been fished, or in some cases, there's also complaints about kind of uh, fees or unsanctioned debits. So may, this could kind of signal the possible kind of mode of operation for these types of uh, uh, predatory apps where they're either phishing or maybe similarly trying to kind of get small sums of money um, uh, out of unsuspecting users. And then the final predatory example are um, more, I guess, the more classical uh, example of abusive lending practices. So 
here's uh, a final example from the Philippines uh, where uh, going through kind of the uh, disaggregated reviews, uh, you know, I guess th these are more classical symptoms of kind of people com having high prevalence of complaining about uh, high interest rates, uh, abusive debt collection practices, um, uh, data privacy issues, and, and so forth. So over the past few months, you know, we took this the around 5,100 um, uh, uh, personal loan apps that we had kind of flagged, manually reviewed, and um, basically tagged them. So just as a quick recap then, so we're starting with that kind of targeted subset. You know, we have this kind of typology where we're splitting between or, or, or kind of tagging direct lending apps, indirect lending apps, and peripheral ones. Uh, we then classify them into predatory or pure fraud based on those some of those signals that we mentioned before, as well as a few others. Um, those that are absent such signals, you know, we, we've we uh, bucketed as legitimate. Uh, and then in cases where, uh, you know, it's a bit more mixed, you know, there's maybe some signs of, of issues, but it seems very inconsistent or, or uh, yeah, it seems inconsistent. We kind of give them the benefit of the doubt and we'll bucket them as ambiguous and kind of we consider a legitimate amb and ambiguous uh, combined to be probably likely to be okay, likely legitimate. In both cases, you know, uh, or in any case, the apps could either remain published on the app stores or be removed. Uh, and, you know, although being removed isn't necessarily proof in itself of, of being uh, uh, fraud or predatory. Certainly, if you we see very high signs that uh, the the prevalence of being removed is much higher. In uh, or sorry, in, in short, it, we do see basically that the the likelihood of being removed uh, for these latter categories, so for the pure predatory um, and uh, likely suspect categories, uh, the prevalence of being removed is noted considerably higher than for uh, legitimate uh, apps or those that we've classified as legitimate. Um, so having finished this classification, uh, this is kind of how our sample then breaks out. So out of the 5,100 uh, personal lending apps, um, we end up seeing around 17% being flagged as legitimate, around 10% as ambiguous, 70% as predatory, and then around maybe four to five percent as what we've kind of characterized as pure pure fraud or if we kind of bucket this into kind of a binary classification of likely legitimate likely suspect uh it's about like one quarter likely legitimate and one quarter three quarters uh likely suspect and overall you know we see that these kind of prevalence rates seem pretty similar across the different country markets maybe some signs again that india is a little bit more exposed In terms of the actual kind of exposure, like the, you know how many how many potential users uh, were exposed to these problematic apps, um, I guess intuitively we do see that you know the legitimate apps do have the highest uh, overall usage, uh, or at least downloads and installs. Um, however, I guess a quick takeaway from this table is that uh, the exposure uh, of potential users to kind of the predatory and pure fraud is still quite high. Um, so within our study sample period, um, you know, it seems like close to 180 million uh, were downloading, downloaded and installed uh, an app, a personal lending app that we'd flagged as kind of being likely suspect. And then one more final kind of caveat on this. So now, now we're looking at the average downloads per app per in the category. Um, and the one comment I want to make on this is that the pure fraud, the average uh, downloads per app in the pure fraud category. So even though the pure fraud apps in percentage terms were fewer, uh, it does seem like the uh, uptake of is noticeably higher vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, the, the apps that are categorized as, as just being predatory. So, you know, the adverse impacts on consumers, I think given this audience, you're, you're, you're well aware. Um, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but you know, there's potential for financial loss due to these kind of the direct fraud or kind of the relative loss as opposed to if they'd kind of gone with a legitimate lender. Uh, other adverse outcomes like the harassment or abuse that they're encountering and loss of trust 
in financial institutions. Now, more from the kind of supply side, how you know how does this affect uh, potentially affect legitimate providers? Um, you know, I guess the question is how how much negative externalities is there are are there uh, in this time series? We're looking at kind of the uh, the Indian uh, personal lending market. So we've queried the uh, historical download data, now restricted to just the, the downloads within India um, uh, for the past uh, roughly year and a half. We aggregate them uh, based on uh, classification into the legitimate versus suspected predatory or fraud uh, categories. And we kind of track them over time. Um, I guess, you know, starting out at the start of this, the study sample, we're seeing that kind of legitimate loan apps are seeing kind of maybe around 400,000, actually uh, 400 daily downloads per day uh, at, the, at its peak. We see that kind of the start of the lockdowns in particular seems to shut down the market quite severely. However, there's kind of a recovery. Um, the recovery, however, seems to be actually then dominated by the suspected predatory or fraudulent loan apps. Uh, around the end of 2020, uh, we're aware that RBI approached Google to have them take down a, a lot of uh, these loan apps. And we actually sort I think we see that come out in the, in the data a bit where there's a pretty sharp drop off initially um, at the end of 2020 that remains for some time. Um, however, a few months later, it seems like the kind of suspect apps are starting to grow again. So in short, it seems like the, you know these kind of some of the more extreme policy solutions have had some short-term success, but alone uh, seem to be insufficient. So um, yeah, I, I guess I'll wrap up here. Hopefully that gives it kind of a flavor of uh, the problem and kind of the systematic evidence uh, surrounding it. I'll turn it over now to Murnal, who will discuss uh, the kind of proposed solution, the proof of, con proof of concept, and uh, what the preliminary results yield. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, now we'll get to the fun or boring part, depending on how you guys want to see it, because we actually show our results. So, do you see? Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right. So, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I'll delve into the actual model and some of the results for our for our pilot that we have for uh, the five thousand one hundred apps. So what do we do? We actually set up uh, machine learning models as a proof of concept for our proposed solution. And as you are aware, there are a magnitude or a variety of uh, machine learning models out there. And I will tell you what we exactly use. The label data for the roughly 5,100 person loan apps is um, classified into likely legitimate versus likely suspect. So this is the binary classification model where we have just two output categories, whether it is a legitimate app or whether it is a suspect app which kind of combines the predatory and the and the fraud categories and then we do a bit uh, of a tighter classification where we use a three category classification model where we have legitimate and we split out predatory and fraud into two separate categories so um, i'll show the results for for both these models for our given machine learning model and we mostly use app metadata uh, the intention is to also use reviews at some point of time but uh, first we want to run the results with uh, metadata because we think metadata is while it is static at the same time uh, these indicators are ex ante and the review data in many ways is noisy and can also be exposed so the review data can come about or uh, take precedence when people are already facing these problems hence the metadata we feel is kind of a better proxy, at least for now. And then we see, we'll see how to integrate the review data going ahead in the future. And um, the interesting thing that we do is most people usually take the entire data set and then use it for the training and the model automatically split, splits it into a training set and a validation set. So while we do that, we also keep a holdout sample. So what we do is for any apps released after 15th of January of this year, we do not put it in the model at all. And we use them to test the out of sample performance of our model. So in that way, the model has not seen this data at, at all. And uh, it is predicting the results on completely unseen data. And again, uh, for each of those models, binary, as well as the three category classification, 
I'll show you our results for uh, the actual in-model performance as well as the out-of-model performance. These are some of the variables that we use. I think Jonathan already covered all of this. So I would just point out that we have a multitude of variables, about um, close to 100, but uh, we do not use all of them. We drop out quite a few. And as you will also see in the results, not all these variables have predictive power. Some of them do, some of them don't. But uh, the point to make here is that, uh, as he also pointed out in the past, that there is visible data that you and I can see. When you go to uh, the app description, you can see the text description, the number of screenshots, the size of the day, uh, the size of the app, uh, as well as uh, other details about the developers. But the metadata also has sort of hidden data, which uh, you and I as users usually cannot observe. And this is about uh, the date creation, the internal version codes, uh, the actual price of the apps, the countries and languages available in, available in, and as well as the downloads as he showed you uh, in the previous slides. So I'll give you uh, an example of uh, transformation of input variables. As I told you, we have like a wide variety of input variables, but not all of them are useful for our purposes. And hence, while we drop some of them, others we transform. So for example, this is a very common thing we do in, uh, in our research is that we transform uh, some of the numeric variables to, to dummy variables. So like if you see in this, uh, in this particular slide here, uh, the address is given as uh, somewhere in California in the US and we cannot use that uh, by itself. So what we end up doing is that we just convert it to a dummy variable, which can be used as an input for our, for our machine learning model. Similarly, uh, this uh, app here has um, this app here has uh, data on um, email of the developer, and uh, again we convert it to like a categorical variable. Another thing that is uh, interesting is that, um, and I also pointed out that apps have their current version number written out there, and this is mostly listed by uh, the developer on the URL, but apart from the version number, we also have something called version code, which is uh, much more informative in the sense that it reflects the number of iterations that the app has gone through. And we use uh, both these variables directly, version code, as well as the current version of the app, which is publicly observable to all of us. The methodology that we use for our um, machine learning model is something called gradient boosting. Now, this is pretty much state of the art in terms of uh, non-text um, machine learning models these days. And the version that we use of gradient boosting is called uh, XGBoost. And what XGBoost actually does is that it kind of builds upon something called uh, uh, trees or randomized trees. So what uh, it does is that this uh, random forest classification is kind of, uh, let's say, Given a kind, um, given a power boost by this XG boost. So, while uh, random forest uses one tree, what XG boost does is that it uses an ensemble of uh, many shallow and weak su successive trees. So, what is shallow and weak? Shallow and weak are trees where the predictive power is just about above fifty percent. But when you combine all these trees together, uh, you get a pretty accurate model because each of the trees improves upon the output of the previous tree. So, it underweights those uh, predictions which are correct, whereas it overweights the ones which are incorrect. So uh, the successive trees, as you keep building more and more of these uh, trees in the ensemble uh, model, uh, it improves upon the predictions as such, and hence we get pretty uh, good uh, results uh, from the model as such. Uh, as I mentioned, the advantages is that it is uh, much more accurate compared to other uh, models out there. Okay again, in terms of handling uh, numeric data, because I showed you in the past that we have to transform some of the text data to numeric data. It does not handle uh, text data at this point. For that, we have to go uh, to neural networks. Um, there's lots of flexibility. Uh, we have uh, tons of uh, hyperparameter tuning options, which allow us to make the functional form more flexible. And it handles missing data or not a number uh, very, uh, very easily as well. So we don't have to do anything to kind of classify the missing data as, uh, as a number, as zeros or, or nots. However, the disadvantage is that because it is such a powerful model, it is more likely to overfit. And that is one of the things that we have to take care of uh, by using an intelligent combination of the hyperparameters and uh, training time scales with data size. So if the data size grows larger, larger, it will take a bit more time to 
train as compared to other uh, simpler uh, machine learning models. So this is the this decision tree for our binary classification model. As you can see, uh, what the algorithm is actually doing is that it just asks a particular question, an if-else kind of question. The cutoffs, I'm not sure if uh, they are visible to you, but the cutoffs uh, are kind of chosen uh, randomly. So that is why it is also called a uh, non-parametric model. We, it does not follow functional form and we do not assign what are the cutoffs which will choose for each of the various variables. And then depending on a yes, no kind of classification, it goes about to, to predict finally when uh, whether a final observation falls as fraud or as, uh, or as uh, likely not fraud. I'm sure that this is not visible uh, to most of you because of uh, the number of uh, this uh, is too small, uh, the, the variable name. But what I'm trying to show you here is the feature importance. So as I told you, we use many features for the prediction of our model. And um, here, what you see is some of those features listed out as in terms of, in terms of importance. So, uh, the most important feature for our binary classification model is, is the size. Then we have the description length, the length of the description of the, of the app in itself. And there's the multitude of rating uh, variables which uh, go right after. And then uh, permissions and SDKs as we go further ahead. So primarily it's about size and description length and uh, a combination of, of ratings and version code. So these seem to be the most uh, prominent variables in terms of uh, predictive power. Uh, what is our accuracy for binary classification? So uh, for the validation set, that is for the uh, sample which the model sees and it kind of breaks it into a training and validation set, we get 90% uh, accuracy in the validation set. For the holdout sample, which we have after 15th of January 2021, uh, we get an accuracy of 84.5% uh, roughly. Then uh, going ahead, I, this, these are the ROC curves, which tell you what is the trade-off between the true positive rate and the false positive rate for our model. And as you see, the validation set, which the model sees, obviously does a much better job. Uh, the area under the curve is 94%. Uh, we hardly have any false positive, which kind of could influence our, uh, our confound our final results. However, for the out-of-sample uh, test set, um, while the area on the curve is still pretty pretty good at around 74%, the thing is that there seems to be quite a loss uh, in terms of increase in false positive rate as the true positive rate goes up. However, I would like to make a caveat here. Uh, the false positive rate in this case implies those apps which we are labeling as fraud or suspect while they are not. So while in terms of a, uh, you know, a classical machine learning person or an econometrician would say this is, this is not the most optimal, the 74%, um, but you can say in many ways, our model is, is a bit more conservative that it, has allow, it allows us to even go uh, and label those apps which are probably not fraud, but ends up getting labeled as fraud. So it, is my, it might as well have more false positives than more false negatives, the point I'm trying to make here. So uh, in that sense, um, some amount of uh, manual vetting at the end would be required after uh, we do the first cut with these uh, with this out of sample data given to us. Uh, similarly, this is the decision tree for the multi-class classification model for the three categories. Um, I will skip over it. Um, and again, uh, the feature importance as in which features are, are the most relevant in terms of predictive power. And for the three categories, uh, the size of the app seems to be most relevant. Uh, the ratings always seems to stand out. So uh, ratings uh, in terms of mean rating, description length, and uh, whether it is rated one, two, three, or five, those have a pretty good predictive power in terms of explaining whether an app would be classified as uh, legitimate suspect uh, and within suspect fraud or uh, predatory. Admittedly, the uh, accuracy goes down a bit because we are keeping our data fixed at around those 5,100 uh, apps, whereas now we have three categories instead of two. So, you know, the model uh, suffers a bit in that sense. And the validation set accuracy goes down to 86% from 90%, whereas the out of sample accuracy goes down to 72% from the 84% that I showed you uh, for the binary classification. And then similarly, these are the 
the receiver operator uh, ROC curves for for the three category classification and for the three uh, category classification. And as you can see, uh, class zero seems to be performing the best uh, where class zero are the, are the legitimate apps. Class one are the predatory apps where still the uh, AOC curves seem to be doing uh, pretty well. And then for the class two, which are the uh, fraud apps, uh, the AOC is the least, but that is understandable because we have the least number of observations for class two, that is, class two, that is the fraud apps as compared to the other two for which we have more observations. Hence, it suffers a bit in terms of uh, the trade-off between the true and false positive rates. Uh, again, um, similar curves, but this time for the out of sample data. So suffer, um, as I showed you, the accuracy of the out of sample comes down to about 74% uh, in, the, in the three category classification. And also the area under the curves are, uh, are, are less uh, accurate than in the binary classification category for the reasons I mentioned before. So what are the main uh, takeaways uh, and options for improving performance? Because as we said that this is just a first cut, a preliminary kind of a, a thing that we try to do. And then we want to see whether we can improve performance, not just uh, out of sample, but also see if we can incorporate a greater data size. So what we intend to do is we can uh, increase the data sample size. So go beyond, go before uh, Jan 2020 or wait a few more months. Uh, uh, this year is almost over and then incorporate some more uh, data for 2021, because right now uh, what we have is up to April, 2021. We've not done any hyperparameter tuning at this point. So these are randomly selected hyperparameters. Hyper so once we do hyperparameter tuning, we would expect uh, to gain some efficiency out there of a few percentage points. Uh, and uh, what we also could do is we could also uh, narrow the windows between training and validation and out of sample increase sets and this would uh, increase the precision because we are comparing similar apps. What we are doing now is we are going too far back uh, for our training validation sample, which is January to the whole of 2020, uh, roughly. And for the out of sample, we are using uh, the, uh, the period after January 15. And admittedly, as you saw in the previous slides, that there has been some kind of a change in structure of the market, especially uh, because of uh, COVID and the and the economic shocks uh, thereabout. So if we kind of use the same uh, sample or the same sample periods, then uh, these models could perform better. So that is something we would like to check as well. And then, as I mentioned, how we could, uh, another plan is how to integrate uh, review data and see whether that improves performance. Because at this point, we are not including any review data while we are using it to determine whether certain apps are fraudulent, predatory, and things of that sort, but we're not incorporating review data in the machine learning model per se, but we plan to do that as well. So um, I'll give it back to Jonathan because I believe he would want to talk about the next steps and then conclude from there on. Yeah, or Mino, maybe you can just leave your, sli uh, your slides. Okay. I think we're, we're running up on time. Okay. Uh, so I think in interest of maybe giving, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we could probably close out uh, and yeah. Maybe open it up to question questions okay. or feedback because um, I think some of this could potentially be be covered in that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And sorry Excellent. for running a long time. So, so, so Thank you. Yeah, I did already. Excellent. Thank you all so much. I'm just going to post. Um, there were three questions we received so far. Maybe we'll start with those. I posted them in the chat. Um, and so the first one is: Would the data from the App Store allowed to track cross-border usage of, a, of an app. Cross-border usage, meaning cross-border availability. Um, if, if that's what the, the question is, then yes. We, we can track which countries a given app package ID is available in. Uh, and in many cases, this is a single country. And in many cases, it's, it's many, uh, maybe even as many as the full 63, like uh, available across all countries. Um, does that answer that question? I assume so. I hope so. Yeah. Um, and are these false positive cases, next question is, are these false positive cases at the margin where these apps exhibit negative behaviors, just not at the threshold to be called fraudulent? 
So I'm not sure I understand the question completely. By false positive, in this case, uh, are those apps which end up, which would be classified as fraudulent or let's say suspect, fraudulent or predatory, uh, it is when they are not. That is our false positive. I think it may be a question on like propensity, like uh, be, yeah. beyond the binary zero one, um, like the propensity. I, I don't know if we, uh, yeah, I mean, Renal, that's something you'd have to answer because I haven't seen the actual output data, uh, but I think that would be the in mind what the question is. And I, I don't know if I have an answer for that uh, off the top of my head. When not just the threshold to be called fraudulent. So, um, so there are these. I don't believe these false positive cases are at the at the margin. So there are negative behaviors, just not at the threshold to be. Um, it's possible. Okay, I understand what he's trying to say. I think um, what uh, the implication here is that. They, the ones we detect as false positives are maybe actually fraudulent, but it's just that the behavior is such that uh, on the threshold, they end up being, tar uh, being classified as non-fraudulent. Um, that is interesting. Uh, and I think we would have to, we have to check then probably how we label or classify, or maybe see if we can uh, see other ways in which we can figure out whether certain reclassify, I would say. But at this point it is, uh, it is hard to say whether it would be on the margin per se. And then the last question, does including metadata on ratings in your algorithm inhibit your ability to identify problematic apps ex ante? Given the inclusion of rating data, why not also include individual ratings? So I think we include individual, uh, sorry, Jonathan, do you want to say something on that, but. Oh, no, I was, well, I was gonna comment that. I mean, it's, it's a good point. Um, I think initially the idea, like when, when we were kind of starting off, we were particularly interested in the kind of what we were seeing as pure fraud, where we, were, we knew that there, were, there was this kind of review farming and kind of bom systematic bombarding very early on after the initial release, where we, in that case, thought that inclusion of ratings uh, made sense. You know, as it's like, given that there are kind of, seem to be kind of a smaller minority of the cases, and it seems like we're kind of getting into more kind of predatory cases as well. Uh, it's true that like, if we're really trying to come up with something that is purely, purely ex ante, then we could, we certainly could and should try models that are even absent use of that, the ratings variables, um, because then it would, you know, it would be uh, in a sense, uh, not dependent on requiring Many users have used the apps, and and uh, so it's a, it's a good it's a good point. Um, it, it was kind of a product of how we initially started the project, but we certainly could test different models that emit uh, those things that require kind of ex post data collection, like the ratings and uh, uh, mean reviews, uh, mean mean ratings, and these kind of things. No, I think it's an interesting uh, point. Maybe we can try and rerun it uh, without using any rating variables and then see how it performs because um, no, no, thanks for that suggestion. And I think uh, I'll just go back to the second point once probably before uh, we conclude. Um, that's an interesting uh, way of looking at it as well. And that is why we think that our solution is pretty much, you know, just more about finding the number of needles in the, in the haystack and then some amount of manual vetting would be required because while we are saying that these are uh, uh, fraudulent or suspect at a certain level, uh, there would have to be some kind of manual vetting of this small number instead of going over you know, the entire gamut of 5,000 or 1,000, even 500, that, which is not possible. Vis-a-vis -vis, say something like 50 or 100 uh, list that I give you, it will be easier to uh, vet those rather than with an expansive number of 500 or 1,000. So yeah, thanks for that su suggestion as well. I've noted uh, both these down. Do you have dynamic ratings data? You could use limited data instead of dropping it. Yeah, I think, I believe we have dynamic. Yeah, we, we, could, we could recover yeah. dynamic rating, yes. uh, rating data as well. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah good suggestions and we'll, thanks, we'll thanks. definitely consider it. Yeah. So. I realize we've run a bit over. Thank you all for staying on on extra. And um, you know, just I think similar to a comment that I see Herman Smith made. I think this is a a really powerful, underappreciated tool 
um, that I do believe regulators and others could use um, in a pretty efficient manager, manner to address this rising and dynamic presence of fraud um, in app stores. I mean, you, the data you shared, to be honest, it's, it's surprising to me, you know, how many have signals of being suspect. Um, you know, I would, if you'd had me guess percentages, it would have been nothing close to what you've shared. And um, I really appreciate, um, you know, I can, I can just see how this could be a solution that you could give to a supervisory authority and then they could make sense of thousands of apps and know which, you know, 100, 200 or so to do give a further look at. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to see this research continue to advance and perhaps to start to test it um, in the marketplaces. So I really want to thank you all for your innovation and all the hard work so far. Um, and I will just close with a little plug for those who uh, are not subscribed to our consumer protection quarterly newsletter. Um, and uh, similarly, our webinar um, announcements, when we have these, we do these once every quarter. Uh, there's a link now where you can sign up a, a form to um, make sure you're on our mailing list so that you get future updates. Um, and I think Jonathan and Marino, probably we can expect a, a report on this in the, in the next few months, right? Yeah, that's the goal. Yep. And I think maybe in the meantime, we could send around the slide deck and we'll have the recording up on our website for those who are interested. Thanks. Yeah, it is. It is. Thanks for the opportunity, Rafe, and uh, IPA as well. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us, and I uh, look forward to the to the next uh, conversation um, in the coming months. And um, have a have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Right. Thanks for your time, everyone. Bye. Bye.